Lou Swanson was born in Durham, North Carolina in 1949. He received his bachelor's degree in political science at St. Andrews Presbyterian College in 1971 and then spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia. He came back to complete his master's in international development from NC State in 1975 and a doctorate in rural sociology from Penn State in 1982. After graduation, he joined the University of Kentucky's Department of Sociology and worked there for 15 years. He moved to Colorado State in 1997 as professor and chair of the sociology department, later becoming associate dean of the College of Liberal Arts. He has spent his career studying agriculture and rural community policy. This article from his presidential address to the Rural Sociological Society in 1990 reflects a decade of his own work contributing to the study of rural communities in the United States in particular. It is important because it critiques a common perception, still very much with us today, that the economic success of family farms is the main determinant of healthy rural communities. Consider the evidence he presents and see what you think. Lewis Swanson was interested in the quality of life in small towns, because at that time, just as it is today, that small town quality of life seemed to be under attack. The deterioration of this quality of life appeared as part of a vicious spiral of decline, provoking population losses, which then further lowered the quality of life, and so on. He starts this chapter in a book about rural America with what still seems like a simple and obvious idea, that if you want to understand what life is like in a small non-metropolitan town, the first question you need to ask will be about what is going on with the farms that lie all around it. He suggested that the prosperity of these farms determines the prosperity of the town in their midst. Going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, this idea is part of a fundamental element in the self-image of the United States. We like to think of the farm population out there growing our food on the prairies as the bedrock of American society. Some of us actually can identify with this farming experience. Here you see me with my dad standing on the combine while his uncle and his cousins stop for a coffee break during the harvest. But how realistic is this image of farm life as the bedrock of American society? In the 21st century, life on a farm is probably about as familiar to most Americans as life on a South Sea island or following the reindeer herds in the north of Sweden. You may have visited a farm, but very few people have ever really lived on one. The farm population of the United States, shown here by age, starts out including four out of every 10 Americans in 1900, nearly half the entire population. Of course, there are some variations by age. Children are overrepresented because people on farms tended to have larger families than people in cities. In contrast, footloose young adults illustrate the old question, how are you going to keep them down on the farm? As many of them took off, at least temporarily, to explore the bright lights and new kinds of jobs and lifestyles in the growing cities. By 1920, less than a third of Americans lived on farms. The wave of immigrants that had once added many new faces to the countryside began to concentrate more and more in cities instead, joining those moving there from the American countryside. The percentages for 1940 dropped again, but this smaller drop from 1920 is interesting because it actually represents two trends. Up to the Great Crash of 1929, people still rushed into cities, but during the Great Depression of the 1930s, there was actually a countercurrent of people thrown out of urban jobs who made their way back to live on family farms with relatives still out there in the countryside. The farms were still about a quarter of the national total population in 1940, but by 1960 the tide was running fast again and only about one American in ten could be found on farms. By both 1980 and 2000, the percentage of people living on farms had dropped to low single digits where it remains today. It may seem a little odd to still think of farm life as the bedrock of American society. If it is, we are all perched on a very tiny outcropping of such bedrock. But keep in mind that these figures only include people living permanently on farms that they own or operate, 
it does not include the shifting population of farm laborers who own no land and only work for wages. These workers are included in other census categories with other kinds of wage workers. Swanson centers his article on a famous study about two quite different towns <coughs> in California's agricultural Central Valley. Like Swanson, Goldschmidt before him was concerned about the quality of life in these small towns. He selected the towns he studied so that they would be matched on several other features that could affect quality of life, such as population size, climate, distance from large cities, and so on, but would differ from each other in one important respect, the organization of agriculture in the surrounding countryside. Around one town, he identified mostly family farms, while around the other town, he found that land ownership had been consolidated as large corporations bought out small farmers and created huge new industrial-scale farming operations. Some of these corporations were national firms investing in local land, while others were local farmers who were able to buy out their neighbors and keep on growing to enormous new sizes for their operations. By comparing these two towns, Goldschmidt wanted to document how this expanding scale of farming operations affected the agricultural labor force. Secondly, he wanted to see whether the quality of life in the two nearby towns was different, and if so, whether he could find any connection between the difference in farm operations and the difference in town quality of life. Such a connection became known as the Goldschmidt hypothesis, or the Goldschmidt model, the idea that the nature of farming determines the quality of life in nearby towns. Goldschmidt found that the older family farm system led to many smaller owner-operated farms where generations of children could grow up, attend the local schools, marry one another, take over the farms in their turn, and in some cases move to town and run businesses that supported the dominant agricultural economy. On the other hand, the consolidation of farming on a larger corporate scale gave rise to more hired laborers who might not be from the local area and who might not stay there for even one generation, let alone several generations. Any profitability from farming flowed to the new owners of the land, so the farm laborers had less money to spend locally than farm families would have done. In addition, mechanization of agriculture meant that the total number of people in the families of farm workers dropped far below the number of people in farm families who would have lived out in the countryside under the older system. So both the number of people in the agricultural sector and their social and economic status changed drastically with consolidation. Goldschmidt detected what he thought were many important connections between this change and the quality of life of his two towns. With much of the profitability of farm operations going to their distant owners, the local community no longer could capture as much business from the agricultural sector. Farm workers had less money to spend from their wages, and big purchases like new tractors, grain silos, and other farm equipment often were made by the big agribusiness firms in distant urban areas, taking the business out of the local community. Not only did farm business transactions often shift out of the local community, since the industrial scale farm operations needed fewer workers, there were fewer local customers for stores and schools and medical clinics, fewer taxpayers living in the town, and as a result, population decline. Progress may have generated unbelievable new volumes of output of wheat, corn, cattle, soybeans, or hogs, but at the same time, it seemed to be strangling the small towns scattered out there in the midst of the fields and barns that grew bigger and bigger as time went by. Goldschmidt hypothesized that consolidation of farms was bad for local towns. Goldschmidt uses the Goldschmidt hypothesis as a starting point for his chapter. A major part of his argument concerns limitations or problems with this hypothesis. For one thing, some scholars who studied the original 1946 publication have suggested that Goldschmidt's two California towns were different in other ways besides just the consolidation of agriculture. These other differences might have had their own effects on quality of life in each place. We won't go into that, but keep this possibility in mind. Goldschmidt also just assumed that historically, small family farms had created a superior social environment. He took the same sentimental view of history as many others, past and present, 
excepting that before the consolidation of agriculture, the American countryside was blanketed by harmonious and supportive communities. Swanson is not so sure about that, but these rose-colored glasses for looking at the rural past and subsistence agriculture is not unique to Goldschmidt. But for people living near the margin of subsistence and survival, who had to get up every day before the rising sun and come back in exhausted when the sun went down, who never took vacations and in many cases never got more than 10 or 20 miles from where they were born during the whole course of their lives, scratching a living year by year from the ground outside their homes may not have been a pastoral paradise. There must be some reason why, whenever the opportunity came along, so many of these farm people jumped up and rushed off to the cities, voting with their feet. But however we look at the realities of life down on the farm in the good old days of the agricultural past, Goldschmidt may still have a point. Good or bad to start with, consolidation of agriculture might tend to drive down the quality of life in isolated non-metro towns. The coin of consolidation has two faces, an increasing scale of production that replaces family farms with wheat fields that never end, and an increasing scale of consumption that means that the products bought by people living in small towns come from distant sources. Swanson takes a careful look at both sides of this consolidation coin. For example, if local farmers produce a bumper crop, it isn't all consumed by people in the nearest town. It fills trucks that haul it to silos, from where it is shifted to rail cars or perhaps even cargo ships sailing for Asia. When the market for your corn, soybeans, and beef is the entire world, you are competing for a share of that global market with all the other farmers on the planet. This worldwide competition drives down the prices you can get per bushel or ton and forces you to seek greater economies of scale and other ways to cut production costs. In the contemporary world, a key way to reduce costs is to reduce the labor inputs into the process, that is, to eliminate jobs. The wheat fields that stretch away over the horizon are harvested by swarms of combines that travel north across the continent with the harvest season. Nobody buys their own combines from the local farm equipment dealer any longer. Fields are planted on contours determined by satellite imaging, fed into the air-conditioned cab of massive tractors rolling across the land. Even family farms that survive must adopt these expensive technologies to stay in competition. On the other side of the coin, consumers in these small non-metro towns now buy most of their food and other commodities from distant producers. Farmers' markets are making a comeback, but today, just as when Swanson wrote in 1990, the local mom-and-pop businesses in small towns are no different from the same small shops in big, big cities. Everywhere, the increasing scale of the global economy drives these small-time operators out of business because they can't compete on prices with Costco and Walmart and Ikea. The same people who cry about the hollowing out of their town, the closing of the school and the post office and the general store, appear shortly afterward in the local Walmart parking lot to buy things made in China and to generate some profits for people in Benton, Arkansas that they will never meet. The bottom line of consolidation for both the agricultural economy of farms and the commercial economy of towns is that local operators no longer form a closed prosperity system. In such a closed system, if one sector like the farms does well, everybody does well. If the farms have a bad year, everybody has a bad year. But like the walls around pre-industrial cities, these walls around local prosperity systems have disappeared. Swanson suggests that when this happens, the link between prosperity of farms and quality of life in towns is also broken. In such a situation, he says, we have no reason to accept the Goldschmidt hypothesis to be true. A few local farmers may be able to transform themselves from traditional family farming into corporate agribusiness operations. They will need lots of capital for buying the technology needed for the new scale of operation. If they can swing these investments, they will need more land in order to justify the expense of the fancy equipment. 
So they find themselves in a race with giant agribusiness corporations to buy out their neighbors who are not keeping up with the competition. Running a farm today is a little like being a shark. If you stop moving, you die. In the end, whether the giant high-tech farm belongs to a local farmer who surfed the wave of consolidation and emerged on top, or whether it belongs to a Japanese investment firm or a giant Wall Street conglomerate, in terms of size, technology, and its business model, all such farms end up looking pretty much the same. A key element of this business model in American agriculture is that labor remains one of the most sensitive and expensive inputs into the production process. Surviving in the consolidation race means finding a way to streamline production of wheat or hogs or blueberries or whatever. The small family farm usually can't compete on this scale any more than a little family business in the city can compete with corporate chains of grocery stores or shoe stores or gas stations. That is why the consolidation process changes agriculture. And that is also why the Goldschmidt hypothesis expects to see deterioration of life in these non-metro towns when consolidation happens. To conclude this review of Swanson's article, we still have to come to an understanding of why he thinks that the Goldschmidt hypothesis may no longer be enough to understand life in the places left behind. We have linked quality of life in small towns both to social class changes in agricultural jobs and to demographic changes such as shrinking numbers of consumers. Swanson doesn't say much about the underlying demographic issue of out-migration and population decline. He considers mainly how agricultural change affects local economic conditions. This makes sense because he wants to tackle the Goldschmidt hypothesis that changes in agriculture affect social class patterns in nearby towns. His central issue concerns inequality, above all, income inequality. Goldschmidt's argument was that lots of small farms leads to low levels of inequality, not only among the farmers themselves, but also among the people in neighboring non-metro towns, because the town people and the farm people interacted with each other continually. In contrast, consolidation of farming could produce much higher income inequality between lots of farm wage laborers and a few farm owners. This inequality on the farms would also be reflected through a complex set of interactions in rising inequality in the nearby towns. The Gini index gives us a common measure of such income inequality. Along the horizontal axis, we add up all the people from lowest income on the left to highest income on the right. Then on the vertical axis, we measure the cumulative share of all the money that people earn. If everybody earned exactly the same income, that is, if there were no inequality at all, then 20% of the people would have 20% of the income, 60% of the people would have 60% of the income, and so on. The result would be a straight 45 degree line rising across the chart. But if incomes are unequal and we've ranked people from lowest to highest, then the first lowest 20% of the people will get a lot less than 20% of the income of the income and the last, highest 20% of the people will get way more than 20% of the income. The curve plotted on our chart will drop down below the straight line of total income equality. The Gini index measures what share of the total area under that straight line of income equality we find between that line and the actual curve that we plot from real incomes of people. The lower the curve drops, the bigger this share of the total area, and the higher the Gini index. An index of zero means no inequality at all. An index of 1.0 would mean that one rich person gets all the income and nobody else gets any at all. So if Goldschmidt were right, consolidation of agriculture should change the social class distribution for both farms and towns and increase the Gini coefficient of inequality. When he looks into the results of several different studies, though, Swanson doesn't zero in on the inequality question at first. He starts out with a more general finding that consolidation of agriculture does not seem to affect the average income of non-metro counties where it happens. In other words, the idea that farm consolidation would make small towns and their non-metro counties poorer places does not seem to be true. 
We can see this for ourselves from another angle if we remember earlier maps that showed the heartland concentration of population losses for non-metro counties. If we look at another map here, this time showing which counties are experiencing falling or rising average incomes, right away we can see that this is not the same pattern. We do, we do see falling average incomes in some counties in that north-south belt in the Great Plains, particularly in the Dakotas, eastern Montana, western Kansas, and the Texas Panhandle. Income also apparently declined in the Appalachian region in West Virginia and eastern Kentucky. But up around the Great Lakes and down the valleys of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, we find counties where average income actually seems to have been rising despite their shrinking populations. The Deep South also has been losing population, but saw rising average incomes in recent years. At this level of average income, we don't seem to need to worry too much about the Goldschmidt hypothesis. But of course, measuring only average income ignores how that income is distributed among the people in a county. Rising average income for a whole county could reflect record profits for a handful of supersized corporate farming operations, even if wages for field hands were stagnant or falling. If we show values of the Gini index of income inequality instead, we get a somewhat different picture. Counties with greatest income inequality are concentrated across the Deep South in one of the regions that also has witnessed declines in county populations. We also see high inequality in eastern Kentucky. Could population losses be linked to more inequality? And if so, which causes which? On the other hand, though, we see that some areas that have been losing population, particularly around the Great Lakes and the Corn Belt from Kansas to Ohio, have quite low income inequality despite shrinking population. This bothers Swanson. How can this be true? If farm consolidation and replacement of farm families by a new, smaller population of mostly farm laborers is not messing up the economies and the incomes of these small towns, why, why not? To answer this riddle, Swanson suggests that another kind of employment has become equally or more important for these small towns in non-metro counties, non-farm jobs. Of course, there have always been non-farm jobs in these towns, but in the past, such jobs mainly provided support to the surrounding farms. People worked in the post office, in schools, in medical clinics, in repair shops for farm machinery, in feed stores, in commercial, professional, and other businesses that relied on local farmers as their main customer base. This is not what Swanson is talking about. A better example would be the gigantic BMW factory built some years ago in upstate South Carolina. That factory appeared in a non-metro county, not even inside an existing town of any size. The cars they built go to customers all over the world, not just out into the surrounding county. The TV sets and groceries and clothes bought by employees are not produced in the county. In fact, Swanson even makes a reverse argument. When non-farm jobs like this appear in one of these non-metro counties, some of the people with these jobs may go home to a farm when the shift ends. The fact that they can hold down an outside job may actually allow families to stay on small-scale farms that otherwise would be swallowed up by corporate agribusiness. This is the Goldschmidt hypothesis completely in reverse, non-farm jobs determining the well-being of the family farms. And that is Swanson's bottom line. The vast new scale of the global economy means that the old local pre-industrial arrangements have melted away. The closed local prosperity system that linked the well-being of family farms to the nearest small towns has been torn down just as surely as the walls around pre-industrial cities. And the economic and social well-being of people depends not on what happens right outside their doors in a local neighborhood, but on where each of these people fits into that new global system of production and consumption.